amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, including humans. These are the terrestrial tetrapods. They took advantage of factors like abundant oxygen in the atmosphere, as well as their powerful skeletons, to flourish. Over evolutionary time, many adaptations were added to the list that allowed vertebrates to fully colonize dry land, including modifications to skin permeability, skeletal support, sexual copulation, birthing, and the parental care of their young. As a result, terrestrial vertebrates are among the most intelligent and socially advanced animals on the planet and the dominant creatures on dry land. In this episode, the term terrestrial tetrapods also includes ourselves, Homo sapiens. And we recognize that land vertebrates really represent a minority in terms of the total number of animal species, but they still hold a dominance in our view because we recognize ourselves in them. We note that vertebrates are extremely intelligent animals. Like this chimpanzee, seen here using a stick to catch ants to eat. Or this Caledonian crow, which has figured out how to use different tools to extract a food reward. They are largely social, and there's an increasing amount of parental care and altruism that can be shown in some lineages, particularly in the birds. And also in the mammals, where we sit. We have this affinity for vertebrates in general, although their biodiversity is low. Out of the approximately one and a half million species of animals on our planet, we're talking about something on the order of about 50,000 vertebrates, half of which are fish. That means that for land vertebrates from amphibia onwards, we're only talking about 25,000 species, which is really a drop in the pan with respect to the overall biodiversity of animals. Terrestrial vertebrates only represent around 1.5% of all animal species. But vertebrates have become such dominant species because they play such important ecological roles in most terrestrial habitats. And so, since the demise of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, the birds and mammals in particular have really taken on an important ecological keystone role. To start our story of the terrestrial tetrapods, we recognize that at about 400 million years ago, by the late Devonian period, some Sarcopterygian-like fish evolved into what would appear to be the ancestor of all terrestrial tetrapods, an amphibious-like creature known as Ichthyostega. Now, Ichthyostega was a fish-like creature that had articulatable limbs that, when out of the water, were able to support its weight. It was also able to breathe air. And so, that would have triggered the colonization of dry land, at least in terms of periodic visits to feed on the plants and insects that were already abundant out there. So it may seem silly to have to say it, but one of the main differences between aquatic and terrestrial environments is that air is a lot drier than water. So this poses a lot of considerable challenges for animals living on dry land. Another main difference between water and air is that water provides buoyancy that air does not, and so animals living on land experience the effects of gravity in a much more important manner, as we can see in this demonstration. Watching this modern lungfish in action gives you some idea of what early efforts of the transition to land might have been like. Terrestrial locomotion has really just been a modification of the original form of swimming, using an S-like or sinusoidal type of pattern. Whipping the tail back and forth in water was modified to alternating the limbs down in contact with the ground to propel itself along as they are in contact with the substrate which, as you can see here, is not necessarily the case when they're surrounded by a buoyant fluid like water. Achieving this transition required modifications to the skeletal system to provide this locomotion on dry land, particularly to counteract the force of gravity pulling the animals onto the ground. 
The solution in land vertebrates relies on them having a very robust skeleton. In particular, we're talking about the evolution of a pelvic girdle and a pectoral girdle that link the legs and the arms to the axial skeleton, allowing them to support themselves on dry land. Another adaptation for robustness is in the vertebrae themselves. They have these extensions off of them known as apophyses, which allow them to brace the vertebrae one against the other, allowing flexibility but preventing hyperextension and possibly breaking that spine. Another fact of these apophyses is that they allow spaces for muscles to attach, making vertebrates very muscular animals. One subgroup of amphibians have a highly evolved locomotory mechanism. We're talking about frogs, which have evolved jumping or saltation as their way of getting around. This has clearly required some important skeletal modifications, such as their long feet and toes to act as hinges, but there's also a lot of fusion of their bones to make the skeleton much more robust for the shock of the landing. Because they may be graceful taking off on those powerful legs, but they're not quite so elegant returning back to Earth. So when we're talking about the vertebrate animals leaving the water for the first time and becoming somewhat amphibious in spending time on land, we recognize that these first amphibia, just like modern amphibia, would have lacked the ability to live on land completely. This is particularly so because of two features. One, their skin is still permeable and subject to desiccation. They dry out, so they need to return to the water frequently to humidify, or else stay in relatively humid environments. The other aspect is that their gametes are not protected from desiccation either, nor are their embryos. So the sperm and eggs are released into the environment for external fertilization, and because of this, and because they're not protected from desiccation, they need to be released into bodies of water. So, for amphibians, Although they may spend much of their time on land, albeit somewhat humid land, to complete their life cycle, they need to return to bodies of water in order to reproduce. Their offspring, or the larval form of amphibians, are fish-like tadpoles. A metamorphosis continues over a period of weeks and months, allowing these aquatic juveniles to eventually turn into terrestrial vertebrates like their parents able to live on land. We see that this amphibious lifestyle brings about many advantages, such as venturing out onto dry land and not being restricted to aquatic environments. But they are required to return to those aquatic habitats periodically because they lack the required features to complete their life cycle on land, namely that their skin, gametes, and embryos lack protection against drying out. Some amphibia, however, have evolved adaptations that allow them to complete some of these lifestyle requirements outside of water, such as certain salamanders who have evolved internal fertilization. In the case of those species, the male stimulates the female with this courtship by wagging his tail to stimulate her belly. When she indicates that she's ready for reproduction, he'll move forward and deposit his sperm on the surface in a package known as a spermatophore. She will then advance and place the spermatophore into her genital opening, which will bring the sperm inside for internal fertilization. This process gives them somewhat more independence from the water in certain stages of the life cycle. But, being amphibian, they're not able to completely separate from the aquatic habitats because the embryos are still not protected from desiccation. The next evolutionary step that allowed animals to live permanently on dry land involved solving these two last challenges that amphibia were facing, one being the permeability of their skin. This problem was solved in reptiles with keratin scales that are impermeable to water loss. This allowed these animals to live in hot and dry environments without drying out themselves. But also critically important was the evolution of the amniotic egg, 
which is a calcium shelled egg that is impermeable to water and humidity, but permeable to respiratory gases like oxygen and CO2. It therefore provides an opportunity for these animals to lay their embryos on dry land without the embryos themselves drying out. So this was a very important feature that gave rise to the first truly terrestrial vertebrates that could live completely on dry land because of their scaly impermeable skin and could completely reproduce on dry land with internal fertilization through sexual copulation and laying their embryos in calcified shells to protect them from drying out in the terrestrial environment. Another feature of terrestrial habitats is that water can be limiting. Therefore, terrestrial animals have been under adaptive pressure to reduce water loss related to excretion and the ridding of metabolic wastes. One solution in the vertebrate was the evolution of a very efficient set of kidneys. The kidneys are excretory organs that are also involved in osmotic balancing of solutes and liquids in the body. The vertebrate kidney is very efficient at the filtration of blood and other circulatory fluids in order to remove wastes, particularly metabolic wastes that would be circulating in the blood, such as nitrogenous products like ammonia, which are the result of a breakdown of proteins and amino acids and to convert them into a less toxic form of urea before excreting them out as a dilute urine. Now the kidney in vertebrates is highly adapted to be able to conserve water, and this is especially true in reptiles, in which these excretory wastes are further concentrated, in order to be able to eliminate them from the body without requiring an excess of water loss, as another adaptation to living on dry land. The Mesozoic era, from about 250 to 65 million years ago, was the age of reptiles, the large reptiles being the dinosaurs. And those dinosaurs originally were fierce predators. As active predators, many reptiles are equipped with great sensory systems that allow them to localize their prey one of which is thermal reception using infrared detection mechanisms in the forms of pits on the face of certain snakes, like pit vipers, where they can read the heat profile of prey. Like this, seen through an infrared camera. This is one way for them to see prey animals at night as they're glowing in their infrared profile. Another important sense that's developed in reptiles, but that also plays an important role in other higher vertebrates, is an olfactory organ in the palate, which is known as the vomeronasal organ, or Jacobson's organ. This organ is highly sensitive to particular forms of molecular detection, and in certain vertebrates they're used in olfaction, just smelling and detecting the presence of food, predators, sexual partners, or other important biological features nearby. This is what snakes are doing when you see their forked tongues flickering in the air. There are two forks on their tongue, and each are capturing molecules on the left and the right. The snake takes it into its mouth and puts it up through the small little pits in the roof of its palate so that the tip of the tongue will touch its vomeronasal organ to be able to identify the molecules that have been deposited on the tongue. This gives it a very, very accurate sense of smell that can even detect differences in molecules between the left and the right forks of that tongue. This stereo capability is due to the fact that its Jacobson's organ is highly sensitive. Higher vertebrates have also seen modifications on their circulatory systems from that basic model that we'd seen in fish. Instead of just having a two-chambered heart that sends the blood on a single loop through the body, in amphibia there's a modification to the circulatory system where there's a division of the atria of the heart into left and right sides receiving blood, and with a partial division of the ventricle being the pump of the heart. 
As a consequence, there are now two circuits to this circulatory system. As blood leaves the heart and goes to the lungs or the skin, depending where there's going to be gas exchange through pulmonary or cutaneous means, then the blood returns directly to the heart for another ventricle pump to the body to receive the delivery of the oxygenated blood. So the consequence here in amphibia and reptiles is that there's a higher blood pressure in the circulatory system because the blood returns to the heart before being delivered to the body. However, there is a partial mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood between the left and the right portions of the ventricle because they're not entirely separate from one another. What this means is that lower vertebrates such as amphibians and reptiles generally have had problems engaging in continuous cardiovascular endurance activities. Whereas it is true that air has 20 times more oxygen than water, the distribution of those gases throughout the body is limited in these lower vertebrates because of the mixing and the inefficient delivery of oxygenated versus non-oxygenated blood. So this means that these kinds of vertebrates have problems engaging in energetic activity for any extended periods of time. This is also compounded by the fact that the muscles that are involved in expanding and contracting the lungs for terrestrial air breathing are also the same muscles that are involved in locomotion for these terrestrial tetrapods. During running, for example, the front limbs would have to move around in contact with the ground and would conflict with those intercostal muscles that need to contract and expand to allow the animal to breathe using its lungs. The conflict between running and breathing for a terrestrial tetrapod means that running is not easy, because those two requirements compete with one another. The reptilian solution was to get the front feet up in the air and to move around on the back feet only via bipedalism. This was the solution for early dinosaurs, which were all bipedal. Unlike this T. rex, which came much later, they were small chicken-like reptiles that would run around on their hind feet at incredible speeds, much faster than any of their hapless four-legged prey, which would have moved something like this. The new successful bipedal body plan led to the onset of the age of these carnivorous dinosaurs during the Mesozoic era. In recognition that the ancestor of dinosaurs was bipedal, we also must note that most tetrapedal dinosaurs had become so secondarily. So animals like the Stegosaurus and the Triceratops, you will note, have smaller front limbs than the hind limbs. That's because their ancestors were bipedal. Nowadays, very few reptiles continue to run on their hind legs. So what does this mean for modern amphibians and reptiles, who have a poorly designed circulatory system that is inefficient at distributing oxygen in the blood before they get tired out? Add to that that there's a constraint to moving around using forelimbs and the intercostal muscles for breathing at the same time well, this means that most reptiles and amphibia, like these ones, are relatively sedentary in their lifestyles. They may occasionally move around at high speeds. Hey, who put that clip in there? Don't, don't worry, no turtles were harmed in the making of this video. As I was saying, like this coral reef snake, they may move quickly, but only for very short periods of time, because they soon become exhausted and need to recuperate, which they can only do slowly as that non-oxygenated blood is flushed out of the system. For this reason, many amphibians and reptiles have evolved means by which they can feed without expending very much energy. For example, some have long, extendable tongues that they can use as traps and snares to get their food. Other strategies that are common in amphibia and reptiles, in order to conserve energy and to avoid the chase, is to just slowly and slowly 
move towards their intended prey, and then pounce at the last minute, thereby only expending energy in one burst of movement and therefore not requiring a circulatory system that's more efficient than the ones that they have. Also, as a consequence of not being able to chase their prey, and given that it may be some time until they're able to secure another meal, many reptiles have evolved a means by which they can eat massive meals and digest them over long periods of time. This is largely because of modifications to the jaw, as well as to the thoracic cage, where the ribs are not attached that can open up and stretch that cavity as something goes down through it. Also, the jaw in snakes is articulatable and can open up almost 180 degrees. The front of the bottom of the jaw can separate, whereas ours is attached at the chin. In snakes, the two sides of the jaw can separate to enable it to get around a huge prey item. And of course, they have very sharp teeth that only point backwards. That means that once something's in their mouth, there's only one direction it can go, because the teeth prevent the prey from coming back out. Another adaptation is that these reptiles and amphibians are capable of breathing at the same time that they have this tremendous mouthful of food, because of the evolution of a secondary palate. This allows the air to bypass the food by going through a nasal cavity and allowing the predator to eat and breathe at the same time. At some point in the Mesozoic era, about 150 million years ago, a small subgroup of dinosaurs had already evolved feathers. This was probably originally for thermoregulatory reasons, to keep them warm in the cool nights. It's also possible that they may have had social communication purposes, such as the feathers of birds nowadays, where they use their plumage to advertise their attractiveness. But one thing is for sure, it eventually led to dinosaurs that could take to the air. The early birds were essentially feathered dinosaurs that could make great leaps and catch some air as they either chased prey or were trying to avoid predators of their own. It may have also been in situations such as gliding from one tree to another in order to save some energy rather than climbing down one tree and walking over to the other and climbing up the next tree. The gliding ability could have been an intermediate stage towards the act of powered flight, which is obviously a very important feature of modern day birds, which are one of the few living descendants of the dinosaurs. Powered flight is an energetically expensive means of locomotion. It requires huge amounts of oxygen, of energy, and nutrients. It also requires very important anatomical adaptations to allow an organism to fly. When we look at birds, we recognize that almost all of their features can be seen through the lens of adaptations to permit them to fly. On one level, the skeleton is highly modified, such as having hollowed out bones so that they're lighter and therefore don't need to carry so much weight, an adaptation that favors efficient flight. The breastbone has an enlarged extension on the front known as a keel, which allows for the attachment of massive flight muscles. We have, of course, the evolution of the forelimbs into wings, which allow thrust and propulsion of the flight. And many of the bones along the vertebral column, including the ribs, the pelvic girdle, and the tail, are fused in order to provide a rigid surface for powered muscular flight which is crucial for this very, very demanding means of getting around. So, as we've seen, flight was preceded by the evolution of feathers, which are essentially just modified scales. They're also made of keratin, the protein substance that makes the scales of reptiles. These would have been modified adaptively to make long plumo structures that, on one hand, would have been very favorable for insulation, such as on these modern geese. And then later on, 
favorable again in that they provide lift and resistance against air currents, allowing for flight. We also see many modifications in the physiology of birds that allows for this extremely demanding activity of flight. One is the modification of their lungs to have a one-way flow of air go through. The lungs' air currents are fueled by contractible air sacs, or big pockets of air that are in strategic areas in the thorax and abdomen to allow air to go as a one-way flow through the system. Therefore, there's never a mixing of oxygenated air coming in with deoxygenated air going out. So it ends up maximizing that concentration gradient, favoring Fick's law, and allowing a very efficient extraction of oxygen from the air into the lungs. One thing that we all know about birds is that they have highly complex social behaviors, including those related to courtship and reproduction. Birds are renowned for cooperating as a mating couple to construct a nest, to incubate the eggs, to care for the offspring after those eggs have hatched, to even train their fledglings after they've left the nest. And so this huge social investment and parental care in birds is in part one of the keys to their success, because they're highly intelligent animals, and the social behavior and the nurturing and parental care that occurs is one of the means by which they can pass on the important cultural knowledge that it takes to be an intelligent bird in the modern world. Now, at some point in the Mesozoic era, small mice-like creatures evolved. They were hairy and nocturnal and were used to hiding from the dinosaurs. But they really caught a break when an asteroid came along and wiped out all the big predators that had been terrorizing these small, scurrying animals for millions of years. Now we're talking about the origin of mammals, who then became a dominant animal type in terrestrial environments after that turnover. The start of the Cenozoic era, or the modern era, since 65 million years ago until today. Mammals are characterized by having very complex skin that contains hairs. Hairs are a feature of mammals alone. It's made of keratin, and so, evolutionarily, it's just a modification of the same reptilian scales that became feathers on birds. And we have long filaments instead that are very effective for thermal regulation, but of course play other roles, such as social communication as well. Mammalian skin is very thick because we have a dense layer of dermis, being a sort of muscular layer to our skin under the outer epidermis, that is glandular and highly innervated with sensitive nerve cells. So our skin is a communication organ as well as a protective one, because we're such social creatures and that contact and touch is very important among mammals. One of the important glands that mammals have is the one that gave the name to our class, the mammary glands that produce milk and which nourish our young offspring. This is one example of a very highly evolved form of parental care that is seen among mammals and indicative of the highly advanced social behaviors that we have that have also been key to our success as social and intelligent animals. Contrary to the reptilian solution to breathing during energetic activity being to free the arms from engaging in locomotion, the mammalian response to this challenge for the compromise between intercostal muscles being used for movement versus breathing is the evolution of a membrane underneath the lungs known as the diaphragm, which acts to inflate and deflate the lungs independently of the intercostal muscles. This is one of the reasons why mammals can be such active animals, even if most of them are still quadrupedal. It's because they can still breathe very effectively using the diaphragm while the intercostal muscles are busily engaged in running at high speeds. In order to satisfy these high levels of activity, we must have adaptations that favor an efficient delivery of oxygen and other nutrients. 
When we look at these higher vertebrates, such as birds and mammals, who have these very high demands on energy and nutrients, we see that there are solutions in the circulatory system, wherein the double loop that we'd seen in amphibians and reptiles is now fully closed with a septum between the left and right ventricles, meaning that there was no longer any mixing of oxygenated and non-oxygenated blood as it returns to the heart, and therefore, with the second pump sending the oxygenated blood directly to the body, to deliver blood to the tissues and the organs under a very high pressure, it's extremely efficient. This allows for these higher vertebrates to be much more active than amphibians and reptiles, because they have circulatory systems that do not compromise on extended energetic endurance. In terms of reproduction, Mammals also have very important adaptations to favor effective reproduction on dry land, including the evolution of copulatory organs. Very few lower vertebrates have copulatory organs, except some reptiles. Most vertebrates will just engage in copulation by pressing the genital openings of male and females together. However, in mammals, we see the evolution of a very specific copulatory organ, we're talking about the male penis, which has evolved specifically to be able to insert itself into the female reproductive tract and to deposit the sperm inside the body, therefore not just having internal fertilization, but an internal transfer such that the gametes are never in contact with dry air and therefore are even more protected against desiccation. On the female side of that reproductive equation, the amniotic egg in mammals has been replaced by an internal gestation, where the units of those eggs have been fused to the uterine membrane in the abdomen of the female, such that the embryo can be brought to full term in the safety, comfort, and protection of the environment of the womb. This adaptation is one that increases reproductive success by ensuring that the offspring have all of the required nutrients and are protected against any dangers from the environment until they're more or less able to be brought into the real world. Now, of course, many mammals have offspring that are capable of walking and interacting with other individuals in relatively short periods of time after birth, on the order of minutes to hours. This is not true for others, such as humans, that require very long periods of infancy, wherein we're more or less helpless, at the mercy of the care of adults and reliant on others of our species to take care of us. This creates a context where many mammals are obligately social creatures, where we help one another. And our success as very complex and intelligent animals is only made possible by the long periods of learning in the safe care of our parents that will allow us to become these complex mammals in the environment. And of course, as humans, we are also mammals that have evolved from the primate lineage. That we were once a group of tree-dwelling mammals in the eastern African forests that became bipedal due to shifts in the environment, where the forests became much more open and that the human ancestors found themselves standing in the hot equatorial sun. Human ancestors like the Australopithecines would have led to the evolution of several human species that have existed in the past but that are extinct today. And we're continuously discovering new specimens that are allowing us to add new species of humans to our family tree. Over the past two and a half million years, several species of humans have existed. Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo floresiensis, which were known as the hobbit because they were very small people and there have been many others. But whereas the appearance of humans on the evolutionary grand scheme of things has been relatively recent, we've had a tremendous impact on the planet, on the environment, and the other organisms with which we share it.